Suzanne. <laughs> Thank you. I am, I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to step away from the microphone for a minute. I'm, I'm a, an English teacher. By, well, I'm a retired English teacher now. But my voice isn't retired, and I can project. So I, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm really humbled by your being here. I, I can't even begin to tell you. We had this great slide presentation that we put to Perry Como's dream along with me. And because uh, who didn't watch Perry Como on Saturday night? Do you know that he was on air for 14 years? No, I, I, that surprised me. But anyway, uh, we, we were rejoicing in so many beautiful pictures of Manhasset. And, and I'm so in love with the trees in Manhasset. And so there were just beautiful vistas of trees. And we'll show the slides later, but it's not working with the music. So you, you'll just have to hum. <laughs> Which is what they did when I walked down the aisle of the Congregational I Church. <laughs> Do you remember? I got married oh, yeah. on the hottest June 30th known to mankind in Manhasset. And we had had this horrible thunderstorm just before I got married. And when they played the chord for the bride to come down the aisle, the music, the organ went, <laughs> and, and the reverend turned around and he said, could everybody hum? <laughs> and so I walked up the aisle with my brother, I was, and I snort when I laugh. So I was not the bride from the uh, catalog by any means. And Daly and, and my sister's friends are here. And, and um, Maureen Kane is here, and I had a wonderful picture of Frank Kane that I want you to look for in my in the slideshow. Uh, Maureen's dad is Frank Kane, who wrote the Johnny Liddell mystery stories, and also a screenplay for Key Witness with Humphrey Bogart. Right? Is that right? I thought it was Humphrey Bogart. Or something. But um, Frank Kane was my first writer, and, and I'll tell you, he was a ball. He was a lot of fun, and, and he even let me use his typewriter once. And while I was typing, I couldn't miss the gorgeous girl on the wall that was from one of the covers of his books. And she was in a slinky red dress. And she had long, raven, I think it was red hair, actually. Absolutely gorgeous. And all his books were like that. And my dad read them all and hid them. And then I went and got them out of the bottom drawer and read them, too. So I, uh, I, I just loved the fact that he was a mystery writer. So uh, Pat Geeson, thank you for coming, and Patty Sansone, and all these people you're going to see over there, they're in a lot of the pictures and stuff, so please take time. And uh, I'm going to take a swig of water, and then uh, I'm going to read to you the introduction to the book. I've, I've um, edited everything down, so it's, none of them are complete. <coughs> So I'm a teacher, and I'm going to read the story, and then I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> so be prepared. And she does ask questions. She After does. 39 years of being married to a teacher, you get a lot of questions. This is true. We lived a privileged childhood growing up when we did in Manhasset. And I think the greatest privilege, beyond the material ones, was the freedom of it. I sat with a group of Georgians recently who had read J.R. Moringer's The Tender Bar. They asked me to speak when they learned of my roots in Manhasset. Mostly, they wanted to know what makes it such a special place. What is it about Manhasset that compels first the writer and then the reader to react so lovingly? Well, my guess is, and I can only talk about the time I spent here, the generation of baby boomers I knew grew up with the town as it was growing up itself. For us, the magic of Manhasset has to do with timing, when all was new. It was a new middle class, the families were young and new, suburbs were a new concept, the highways to Long Island were new, shopping centers were new. The new residents of Manhasset had the fire of post-World War II in their bellies, Fifth Avenue stores at their fingertips, and an economy that was growing in leaps and bounds. And the most important city in the world was just a train ride away. And you didn't have to change it, Jamaica. <laughs> As kids, we boarded the Long Island Railroad and rode into the city to be greeted by our fathers at Penn Station. They showed us the sights, taught us the grid of the streets, and if we were lucky, 
took us to dinner in Little Italy or Chinatown. By the time we were teens, we no longer required adults to meet us at Penn Station. We had a given perimeter in which we were permitted to roam. Madison to 5th, 34th Street to Central Park. Perhaps breaking beyond the boundaries of Manhasset early allowed other barriers to come down as well. I know these things happened with great struggle, but I believe they happened because Manhasset was part of the epicenter of changing times. Everything that was really large in the 60s was so much smaller then. But that's not to say the stress of living such a perfect life came without a costly toll. We shared a golden era, but it didn't spare us from steely pain. Perhaps these are the other reasons for the uncommon bonds of Manhasset baby boomers. But we had to grow up. And you know as well as I do, once you commit yourself to adulthood, it's a long time before you get to look back. So given that opportunity in my 60s, I've chosen to dwell on the times we enjoy remembering. Thank you. So I, 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 uh, I have a few questions now. I hope you're paying attention. <laughs> And, and my questions really involve how did you come to Manhattan? How did your family come here? I know Bob Luger told me a story the other day. His wife was born in 1922 on Summit Avenue, his first wife, Grace. And, um, and then Bob's family came looking for houses in Garden City or Manhattan in 1930. And it was the Jamaica stuff that was the deciding factor. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And where was your first house, Bob? Ryder Road. Uh, 189, I think. 189. Ryder Road. Ryder Road. You know, I have a good fortune. People say, you know so many people in Manhasset. Well, I, I lived in three different neighborhoods in Manhasset. And, and I played on Ryder Road in his place incessantly. I mean, those people used to say to me, Where do you, what house are you in? All the time. I went to Santa Claus, Muncie Park, Santa Claus. I lived at the Giesens house. And then I started bringing my mother over to the Giesens house. And she lived there too. So, uh, I, you know, and, and I, I've often said that um, I owe a debt of gratitude to the fathers of Manhasset because after my own father died when I was quite young, they were always there for me. They took me to the father-daughter dances. They took me out to dinner when it was a special occasion. And I really, they were great men. And, and, uh, and I'm very, very thankful for all of that. But um, I also wanted to ask what anyone else, how did your folks come to Manhattan? Do you know how ours did, Jim? Are you speaking? Do you, yes, do you? Well, uh, we had lived in California for two years. And then my father was transferred back, our father was transferred back to New York. And we lived in uh, Woodside for a while while they looked for a house. But we stayed with the family who lived there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we bought the first house at 110 Mill Spring Road. Right. Which was uh, in uh, Strathmore, just about mm -hmm. in Strathmore. Mm -hmm. How many of these? Well, my parents um, lived in Garden City. But it was St. Mary's. It was the St. Mary's Elementary School um, that, uh, that brought them to uh -huh. um, Manhasset. And my grandfather, remember my father saying, my grandfather was horrified because my father paid twenty-five thousand dollars for the house. He <laughs> <laughs> <You> lived on <laughs> his place in Park. Nancy, you're shaking your head. Oh, is that the St. Mary's? For the schools in St. Mary's, we moved in 1952 from Flushing. Uh huh. For the schools. Right. Right. You know, it was just a wonderful place. And BBC and all the wonderful mm -hmm. things that were happening there. Uh, you've been here 57 years, yes. you told me. Yes, go ahead. I have a different one, if I may. Please. Uh, I'm like, it's a lot older than most of you folks here. I'm only, well, my name is uh, Bob Peck. Oh, sure. Uh, we know you. Oh, sure. We know you. Oh, okay. Elizabeth Peck. Elizabeth Peck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We all know everything. We know. Yeah. Uh, my dad was working uh, at a radio station out in Minneapolis. We were all born in Minnesota. And in those days, in the early 40s, the Walter Cronkites and the Eric Severides of the world who were out in the Midwest were coming to CBS in New York. My dad being at a radio station out in Minneapolis, WCCO, 
had a chance to go to CBS in New York. So we moved to the Peck family from Minneapolis. And he was told uh -huh. by some of these people out there, you're going to New York, you look up this town of Manhattan, that's where you got to live. Wow. What so, year was that, Tom? 1943. Wow. Um, so we moved right from Minneapolis, uh -huh. right to Manhattan. What road? Uh, a little, little street called Beachwood Avenue. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I'm still in town at the Flower Hill for 100 years. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks to Walter Cronkite. Why do I associate the post office with the PEX? Is there a post office connection? Well, I worked there as a kid in college, and so did my brother. Oh, that might be it. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. I'm feeling like you throw me a letter. <laughs> um, anyone else? I have one. OK. Let's go. Um, my father, uh, my mother moved here in 1938 from the Bronx, and uh, my father moved to Strathmore Vanderbilt, where she was, uh -huh. a couple of years later. But they didn't know each other until she was a senior in high school, and she went into the city because there was there were no stores here then. She went into the city with his sister to shop, uh -huh. and on the way back on the train, this tall gawky, she saw an geeky looking guy, came by and had his bag of whatever, and pulls out an ugly yellow bathing suit. And he took one look at her, oh, he took one look at my mother, and fell in love, and after college, she got married to him. And they moved to oh. Stratford Vanderbilt. What road? Garden Turn. Oh, nice. You were right by the Beatties, didn't you tell me that? Is yes. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah, my mother was, was their babysitter. Oh, that's great. That's great. Why don't you stand up? It would be nice, so this way everyone can hear. I'm a Mary Conroy Stewart. I think many of you know my brother John, who stayed in Manhattan for all those years. But, um, and your sister Mary was in our class. Right, sure. But we came to Manhasset by virtue of the Throgs Neck Bridge. Mr. Robert Moses, in building the Throgs Neck Bridge, took eminent domain over a bunch of places near where the bridge was going to be for the off ramps. Mm -hmm. And they took the Conroy House in Bayside, New York. And we moved here when I was in seventh grade and absolutely loved our time here in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I think my brother even uh, was a boyfriend for maybe a time. Still. Verifying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I have a cut uh, uh, in real estate, Domain, Domain Real Estate, you know what you're doing. Anyway, uh, we went to see uh, him to find a place to live, and, and uh, he knew he didn't have too much money. He said, Gee, I have one little piece, it's on the railroad track, but it's called Upper Plan Dome, but it's a nice little plot. Mm -hmm. And he knew my husband was a builder, so. We went in there and we bought, the, we built the house and we knew just all the times when the train came and went because that's when we stopped our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of Long Ridge and uh, it was quite a long uh, 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 street and one time the um, garbage people, the brakes broke and came careening down and smashed the whole front of our house. Oh. But uh, anyway, that was all. And what is your name? Thank you. Your name? Or Phyllis Jordan. 